this video I wanted to provide a quick introduction to post-processing. Now post-processing is such a large topic to cover um, it would be impossible to do this in just one video. So for this first video I just wanted to provide a quick run-through of my own post-processing workflow so you can see how I would normally edit um, my photos. Um, now one thing I do want to point out is that normally I would probably do a lot more to an image than this um, but for the purpose of this video I'm just going to show you quickly how I use a combination of of Lightroom and Photoshop to edit my photos. First thing I feel I should mention is that there's no real right or wrong way to edit your photos. Um, and everyone will develop their own post-processing workflow. So when I show you what I'm doing, I'm not telling you this is how you should be doing it. I'm just showing you how I do it. Um, and maybe you'll find this useful. Um, the other thing to point out is that uh, when I do my post-processing, I tend to use a combination of Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. Now, Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Lightroom are really the industry standard for post-processing. These programs are what the majority of photographers use. Um, I should mention, however, that if you're not ready to invest in um, Photoshop and Lightroom, there are other, other options available. So for instance, um, you could buy Adobe Photoshop Elements, which actually comes free with a lot of um, computers these days. and that gives you access to many of the features of Adobe Photoshop, including um, Camera Raw, which is very similar to Lightroom um, in many aspects. Um, the other thing you might want to consider are some of the free um, softwares available. So for, for instance, there's some software called Darktable. There's another one called Lightzone. So you might want to look into those as well. I haven't used these pieces of software myself, um, but I have been told by friends that they're worth um, looking at. Also, when you buy your camera, a lot of camera manufacturers will provide some form of post-processing software. Um, so you can always give it a go without having to buy Photoshop and Lightroom. However, I would recommend that you use these two pieces of software because they really are the industry standard. Personally, for my own workflow, I find that Lightroom works best for making global changes to images. So, for instance, adjusting um, uh, white balance and exposure, um, maybe changing some of the hue and saturation settings. All of this I like to do in Lightroom before then opening the image up in Photoshop. And then in Photoshop I generally find that um, Photoshop is better for doing local changes. So for instance, uh, doing exposure blending, maybe some dodging and burning in a certain area of an image. Anything where I'm just going to be working within a certain region of the image, I tend to do in Photoshop uh, rather than Lightroom. Now you can do some of that work in Lightroom as well, but I find Photoshop works better for that. So without any further ado, I'm going to dive straight in and we'll start editing this image that I've got here. So we're going to be editing this image, which I took in the Alps. Um, and I've opened this raw file up in Adobe Lightroom. So as you can see, this as a, because this is a raw file, the colors are just looking a little bit flat. Um, it certainly needs a few basic changes made to it just to, just to bring it, just to make it a little bit better. So generally the first thing I would do is crop the image. And in this case, what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm just going to bring it in a little bit tighter. I think we've got too much sky going on up here. So I'm going to bring that sky down a little bit. I mean, I also don't, I also feel like some of this foreground is slightly unnecessary as well. So um, I'm just going to bring the bottom of the crop up there. Um, we've got the Agreel de Midi up here in the corner near this top right hand third, but it's not, I don't think it needs to sit exactly on that top right hand third. But yeah, I think somewhere about there is about right. So we'll go ahead and crop the image like that. The next thing I'm going to do, um, and this is usually one of the first things I do, is I, when you scroll down here on the right in Lightroom, you'll find that there's these two settings, remove chromatic aberration and enable profile corrections. Now what this does essentially is Lightroom um, can recognize um, often the lens that you're using. If, uh, Lightroom's got a lot of presets built into it which match up with many of the lenses which are on sale and um, it can use presets to correct for instance the chromatic aberration of those lenses and also um, any distortion that those lenses caused. So I'll always usually tick those two boxes and then I'll scroll back up to the top and begin working through these sliders that we have up here. So the top section here, we've got um, temperature. So this is essentially the, the white balance of the image. And I just feel that this image could just do with being a little bit warmer in this case. So just move it to the right 
Um, I think probably somewhere about there is about right. And I might just add the tint. I think that's gone too far. I think just maybe a, a slight tint adjustment more to the magenta. Uh, just to add a little bit of color to, to the sky there. I think that looks good. Um, now the next thing I'm going to do is adjust the exposure. Now you can see up here on the top right hand corner got the histogram and you can see that the image is slightly underexposed. So I'm just going to boost that exposure ever so slightly, probably up to about 0.25, maybe that's a little bit too high, 0.2, something like that. And I'm also going to add a little contrast to the image as well. So that's just going to make the image pop slightly. You can see that that's bringing out those rocks a little bit. I'm also going to drop down the highlights. Generally with a lot of landscape photos you'll find that by dropping the highlights that tends to bring out more definition in the clouds of the sky. So I drop those highlights down slightly and also I'm going to boost the shadows. Now that just prevents some of these dark areas from being a little bit too dark. And it's always worth just keeping half an eye on your histogram to make sure that you're not um, clipping your blacks or clipping your highlights too much. The whites, I'm going to boost, as we can see, there's a little bit of room up here on the histogram to boost those whites a little. So I'm just going to boost those up a little bit like that, probably to about plus 0.35, maybe about there. And the blacks, similarly, I'm just going to drop those down a little bit, but not too much. They don't need too much. There we go. So now we're not clipping the blacks there, but I've just managed to drop, drop them down slightly. The next sliders are the clarity, the vibrance and the saturation. Now I don't like to use these sliders too much, um, to be honest. Clarity, if I use it at all, I'll maybe only go up to about plus 11 or so. Um, sometimes it can just make your image look a little bit over sharpened if you go too overboard with the clarity. And the vibrance again, you know, maybe I'll add a slight boost to vibrance. Generally with these clarity and vibrance, I don't like going over either plus or minus 15, any more than that, and it just starts to, to, to go a bit too far in my own opinion. So I tend not to use these too much. I think probably in this image, clarity, sorry, vibrance probably to about plus nine is, is about right. The next panel is the, um, it's the curves panel. Now I personally for landscapes like to add a slight S curve, um, using the curves panel. Now what this does is it increases the contrast even further. Um, so you, by adding this curve, you can see in this panel here, you've got um, an overlay of your histogram and then you've got this line here, which you can use to adjust some of the dark. So in this region here, what I'll do, well, the, this is kind of a peak of the, the darks tones. I'm just gonna drop that down slightly. I don't think it needs much and then the lights, I'm gonna increase those slightly, and this just adds a little bit of an S curve, which is adding more contrast to the image, and just making the image pop that little bit more. Um, and I'll often add an S curve to the image, um, the extreme, but how far I'll go is really depends on the image itself. I'm not gonna to touch the HSL panel in this particular image. I don't think that the colors need much adjustment, but essentially what this, panel enables you to do is select individual colors and adjust their hue, saturation, and luminance. So for instance, if I wanted to increase the, the purples in an image, I could uh, increase the saturation of those purples like so, and it looks awful if you obviously go to the full extremes, but you can be quite subtle about it if that's what you want to do. Um, personally, I don't think this image needs it, so I'm just gonna leave all of these dead center. The next thing I'm going to do here in Lightroom, and I think this is probably going to be the final thing um, that I'm going to be doing because I don't tend not to use the sharpening panel at all. If I do any sharpening to an image, I tend to use um, a technique in Photoshop, which involves using the um, high pass filter. And I find that that works a lot better than using the sharpening tool in um, Lightroom. So I tend not to touch the sharpening tool here, but what I do do sometimes is I'll add maybe a slight vignette um, so in this case, I'm just going to, you can either add a white vignette, which just looks awful, um, might be useful if you're doing certain kind of artistic wedding photos, but sometimes just a very subtle dark vignette, I find sometimes works for landscape images. Sometimes it doesn't, a lot of people don't like them, but I think that if it's subtle enough that you don't notice it, it can often just help to draw the eye to the center 
of the image. So I'm just going to add a minus four vignette, which is just going to darken those corners ever so slightly. Um, and I think that that's absolutely fine. Um, I think that's probably all we need to do here in Lightroom. A couple of things to point out in Lightroom is you can add ND grads. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to brighten your sky or darken your sky, you can essentially simulate having an ND grad filter. Um, personally, I don't, I don't think this image needs it, but I do use those from time to time. The other thing you can do, uh, you can you can add a, a radial filter as well if you wanted to. If you did want to do local adjustments in Lightroom, you can use this brush up here. Um, again, I don't think this image needs it um, done in Lightroom, and most of my local adjustments, as I mentioned earlier, I tend to do in Photoshop. Uh, you can use a spot removal tool to remove dust spots such as this. Um, but actually, to be honest, I find that this often doesn't work too well. It can often create little artifacts in your images. So I tend not to use the dust deletion tool in um, Lightroom. I tend to do the dust deletion in Photoshop. So once I'm happy with the image in Lightroom, what I'll do is I'll right click the image down below here in the bottom bar and then I'll go to edit in Photoshop. And this is going to open the image up now in Photoshop so that we can go on and do some more local changes to the image. So now I've got the image opened up in Photoshop, the first thing I'm going to do is just sort out these dust spots. And I find that the best tool for doing that um, is the heal tool, which is this icon which looks like a plaster. And make sure you've got it set to content aware you can just paint out these, these dust spots. What I'll normally do actually is zoom in and I'll sort of scroll around the sky and I'll just keep an eye out for any, any little dust spots. You can see there's a couple here. I'll just clean those off. Um, there's one up there too. So just scan around the sky. Um, normally the sky is the, the, the main culprit for dust spots. You'll often won't be able to see them in other parts of the image. So, but it is worth, you know, just keeping an eye out for any of those dust spots elsewhere as well, and just working your way around the image and just making sure that you don't have any dust spots because there really isn't much of an excuse these days for, for editing a, an image and leaving dust spots in the image at all. So always the first thing I'll do in Photoshop. The next thing I think that I want to do is um, I just feel like I want to add a little bit more contrast to the sky. And this is what I mean by making local adjustments in Photoshop. Um, so in order to do a change to the sky that's not going to affect the rest of the image, what I normally do is create an extra adjustment layer. So you can do this using these tools up here. So for instance, in this case, what I'm gonna do is create a curves layer and boost the contrast of this. Now I could create a, a, a contrast layer if I wanted to, but personally I prefer the control that you get from using the curves layer. Um, so when each time you click one of these icons, what it does is because Photoshop works on a system of layers, it will create a new adjustment layer. So you can do um, basically non-destructive changes. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is just decrease those darks slightly and increase uh, just increase those brights as well, just to give a little bit more contrast to the sky. And as you can see, if I, I can then hide that layer and you can see how that change is affecting the image overall. I only want that to affect the sky. And you'll notice that when I created this layer, um, it created this white box here. Now this is actually a layer mask. Now a layer mask is essentially a layer that you can use to hide certain regions of your adjustment. So, um, the, the way to remember this is that when it's when that layer is white, it allows those adjustments to be seen. When it's black, it basically hides those adjustments. So for instance, if I was to select this um, layer adjustment, sorry, this, this layer mask and do uh, control I, what that's done is it's inverted the layer mask. So now um, this whole adjustment layer of curves of this whole curves adjustment layer is affected by a black layer mask. So you can't see the adjustment. So what I can do now is, is if I take a, a white paintbrush and I've got that layer mask selected, I can paint in uh, white and I can just paint in the sky. And what this is gonna do, if I 
um, just increase the opacity slightly to 100%, you can see that this is actually painting in the adjustment um, to the curves just into the sky there. And so this is enabling me to adjust the, uh, the contrast in the sky without adjusting the contrast elsewhere in the image. So I can, if I hide that, you can just see how that's just affecting the sky. Um, I think actually what I'm going to do is just drop that a little bit higher, like so. So that's really brought those darks down a little bit lower. And the other thing you can do if you think that you've gone a little bit too far is you can adjust the opacity of that layer. And that just makes the adjustment slightly more subtle. And as you can see, that's just affecting the sky. So I think that looks pretty good. Um, so I'm going to stick with that. And obviously, if I if I decided I didn't like that adjustment, what I could do is is I could actually delete that layer and try it again, or try something different. Um, you know, there's no harm in just playing around in Photoshop and trying lots of different things until you get it um, looking how you want it to look. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use what we call a luminosity mask. Now, people get quite confused about what a lumin luminosity mask is. So as, as long as you remember that on a layer mask, white areas of that layer mask will allow your adjustments to come through and black areas will hide those areas of adjustment. Um, so what I'm going to do in this instance is essentially what I, I, I'm going to create a uh, another curves layer. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to image and apply image. And what this does is it creates a black and white version of your image and applies that to your layer mask. Or if, if I now hold down the option key on a Mac um, and click that on that uh, and click on and click on the layer mask, this is going to show me what my layer mask looks like. And as you can see the layer mask itself in this instance is a black and white version of my image. What I want to do here actually is adjust the tones in the rocks of the image. So in order to do that, I'm actually going, as you can see, the rocks are, are black in this image because this is what we call a light luminosity mask. But if I do command I, I can invert that layer mask so that now the rocks are white um, and this is going to allow more change to affect those rocks and less change will be affecting the sky. Now, this, I'm running through this very quickly. Uh, luminosity masks are something which um, really deserve a video of their own, and I will cover luminosity masks in more depth in future. There are also bits of software and plugins you can use. So, for instance, I use TK Actions that will generate these luminosity masks very quickly for you and give you more control over them. Um, but for the purposes of this video, I just wanted to introduce the concept of luminosity masks because although it's something that a lot of people shy away from when you know it's first starting out with uh, post-processing, I think they're a really valuable tool. So I just wanted to introduce them as a concept in this video so that you can see uh, essentially what a luminosity mask is. Um, and as I say, I'll cover these in more detail later. Um, but what I've got here now, so I've got this luminos luminosity mask applied to this curves layer. And if I now just darken um, the curves, as you can see, if I, you know, I can show this to the extreme, it's not really affecting these bright areas, but it is affecting the dark areas. Um, and that's because we've got a luminosity mask on there. And I'm just going to drop that ever so slightly, probably to about this level here. And I think that, that looks pretty good. So I think that's, I think we're getting there now with this image. I don't think it needs an awful lot doing to it. I think just one final thing that I'm going to do in this case is add um, a slight warming filter to it. I think it's way too extreme at the moment. So I'm just going to drop that right back um, and I'm just going to bring it in just until it adds just a very subtle bit of warmth to the image. And I think that that is probably about right. So there we go. I think that I'm happy with that image now. This has been a really quick edit of the image, um, just to show you very briefly what my sort of workflow is and what it involves. Um, I hope you found this video useful. It's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, normally, when I'm editing photos, it will obviously take me a lot longer than this. I'll often do um, many more adjustments to the image. Um, I do tend to use other tools such as TK Actions to do an awful lot of my editing. Um, I will provide a tutorial on using TK Actions because I think it's a, a highly valuable tool. There are plenty of other great tools out there as well. So for instance, Raya Pro, 
um, Lumenzia, those kind of plugins are really useful for Photoshop. So if, you, if you've got Photoshop, then absolutely it's worth looking into getting hold of some of these Luminosity Mask uh, plugins. Um, but I will do some more tutorials on the use of Luminosity Masks in the future because I, I really think they're hugely useful for, for your post-processing. Many more advanced things to cover when it comes to post-processing, but hopefully you found this useful as a very brief introduction to post-processing. Um, now, some people get quite funny about post-processing. A lot of people uh, feel that um, it's almost dishonest to do any form of post-processing. Um, personally, I would highly disagree with that kind of um, mentality. I think if you're shooting in RAW, you have to do a form of post-processing to those images in order to make them presentable. Um, a RAW images tend to just look completely flat, so um, some degree of post-processing is usually required for RAW images. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, back in the days of film uh, photography, we didn't have Photoshop, we didn't do this kind of editing. Um, but actually, in many instances, people did do this form of editing. So, for instance, Ansel Adams, who is one of the most famous large format film landscape photographers of the, the 20th century, um, he used to do exposure blends in the darkroom by um, basically adjusting the length of time that he would expose the sky and the foreground. Um, basically his sky and his foreground, he'd, he'd create essentially what are um, layer masks when he was exposing his film so that his foreground would be exposed for a different length of time to the sky. Um, so that's exposure blending. So people have been doing this with with film photography for years. I don't have any issue with it at all. Um, and um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really a personal decision as to how far you go. Um, personally, I, you know, I always think that the aim of a landscape photographer should be to you know, create, make images look as natural as possible. And if you are going for fantastical, over-processed HDR images, um, you know, make sure that you, you know, that, that's okay. There's no, I have, no issue with that as long as you're saying that these images are composites if you put in a different sky. Um, you know, trying to pass them off as, a, as being real or natural I think is possibly a little bit inaccurate but uh, that's my own standpoint. Everyone has their own point of view and everyone will do this in a different way. It's kind of the joy of photography so you know just have fun with it, experiment, try lots of things out, um, find what suits you best and yeah, just enjoy it. For me, post-processing is a whole part of photography. Um, and, you know, often you can't get out when it's rainy and it's wet and it's horrible. Um, so, you know, by staying at home and doing a little bit of post-processing, it's just another added element of photography that um, becomes, you know, part of this fantastic hobby that we do. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you might have found some of this useful. Um, like I say, this was just to give a quick overview of my own uh, workflow. Um, I appreciate that I probably skimmed over a lot of this rather quickly, um, but I will go into much more detail in future videos. So make sure you click like if you like this video. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the channel already. Um, we'll have lots more videos coming up on post-processing. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to, to putting those together. All right, take care. We'll see you next time. Thank you.